for me, I had to learn about material composition of tubes and what would be best for someone that was fishing cold weather and warm weather. And then I had to find a manufacturer that could manufacture draw tubing to my specifications, my thickness, my material compositions, and cut them to length for me to the right sizes. Oh, I just take my right. money. Would so, you just take my money? Because I right. can't well, think on that level. That's like a <laughs> that's whole other I, level. Hot and cold right. plastic. Well, that's, I mean, what, seriously? that's where I had to go if I wanted to try to, to be as good as I possibly could. And I knew what I wanted. And I know that what I want, it's going to probably be more picky than the average person. So if I can make myself happy, then maybe it's that maybe that's good enough. I'm not sure. Welcome to the Surfcasters Journal Night Shift Podcast. Our mission is to share our passion of surf fishing by bringing you interviews and conversations with some of the sport's most fascinating people. I'm your host, Zeno Froman, co-founder of Surfcasters Journal at surfcastersjournal.com. So let's jump right into today's episode. Today, we have a pleasure of having Jamie from Flatland, the surfcasting. He's one of the best surfcasting gurus when it comes to making bags. In the last few years, you're going to see a lot of his bags in the surf. He does some really exceptional work. He's a thinker. He's got patents on, on a boga grip. He, he's got a lot of stuff. So welcome, Jamie. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. I, you got to kind of walk me through this timeline because it's a fascinating. You are, you are fishing Cape Cod since you're a child. You, you, you are a flatlander because yeah. you're living in flatland. So just give us some background on how did this all came about. Yeah, so flatlander surf casting, it, it started more or less by accident. Um, in August of 2013, during a family vacation, me and my wife and kids, um, on Spring Hill beach, um, I was out fishing the sunrise and there was this rare blitz that happened. And as I struggled to swap out to a longer distance, RM Smith, jig Smith, uh, my hooks got snagged in my inexpensive surf bag you know the story the fish moved out of reach uh i could no longer get them and i'm there for a week and a blitz is rare on that beach as it is so the fish were probably in the canal and they just happened to have some at the beach so i missed those fish and so i started to do some research and i wasn't even aware at the time that there were bags out there that were resistant to snagging um sailcloth bags but as I started to do more and more research about this, um, I found two companies that two guys that were out there that had websites that were building building bags. I'm sure you're probably familiar with both of them. Um, and when I went to eventually order my first real bag, the website was gone. I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna go so there. Like, I, I kind of well, yeah. Uh, I'm not even, I'm not going to name names at all, but, but it, it, it was gone. In so those then days, I, it was kind of a wild west of Well, bad. it was. And then, and then I went to the, to my number two choice and literally the same thing happened. I get ready to order a bag and the website's gone. So I'm back to square one. And, um, I, I guess I kind of learned that most of the people that had built bags kind of did it as a hobby. And they had a real job and they would come home from work. I figured, why not just try to do my own? I'm pretty much a tinkerer. I don't know, kind of get like a mechanical engineering mind, I guess. And it, it, at that time, my wife, um, she was really preoccupied because she was working her full-time job and she was also earning her master's degree in pharmacology and toxicology. And our kids were teenagers and they were doing their own thing. So I had time on my hands. I had a full-time job. I was in the, in the bicycle business, um, important distribution, but I had time on my hands. So started to do some research about the whole thing. Ended up destroying two cheap sewing machines uh, in that first bag. Um, pretty bullheaded, wasn't going to... Let that but hold on me. a second. I, I got to back up a little bit because I, I, I read your, Go your ahead. kind of like history. And 
you know, some people's like, oh, well, there's this guy in Wisconsin and making bags. What they don't realize is that that you're like a professional walleye angler, uh, St. Croix pro stuff guy oh. doing like the national circuit. Right. I, mean, I, I, I swear to God. I mean, I looked at you as you're the bag guy. I did not realize that your fishing skills are on par with your bag makers. I know you don't you don't tell people, but I think people would like to know about it. So the, fill me in. Yeah. So I used to, um, I fished with my good buddy, Rudy, who now lives, now lives out in Colorado. And we would fish on, uh, the Cabela's, uh, national walleye circuit. And then there were, and there were a few other local circuits that were in, uh, Illinois and Wisconsin, but Cabela's was the main one that we fished. And that took us, took us pretty much all around, I would say the, the Midwest, you know, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, those states, stuff like that, Kansas. So we would we would fish this tournament series. And uh yeah, you mentioned St. Croix. We were um on the St. Croix Pro Staff and we were on Pro Staff with uh Storm Lures. Yeah, my point's got a little bit of a creed there. It's not it's not you're just not a guy that just builds bag in some shed like a unibomber out there. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, I had a, I had a, a pretty good amount of, uh, of, of fishing knowledge, but not necessarily salt. Well, that, that is true. So, okay. So let's go back to, to, you know, what's the hardest lesson here in, in, in trying to come up with you? I, I, I'm assuming at this time, you're just trying to make a bag for yourself. Yeah, that was really the hardest. That was the, the initial thing is that I just wanted to make myself a bag. And I did ultimately succeed. I, I ended up, you know, having to learn and buy a industrial walking foot machine. And uh, I, as I tell my friends, that first bag probably cost me twenty five hundred bucks. Well, yeah, you 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 realize most people just don't come and buy an industrial machine no. when they just want to make something. They don't. They don't. So it 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 kind of what happened from there is that I posted that first bag on my. Um, personal Facebook page. And as, as chance would have it, a gal that I was friends with from uh, Ripon College, where I went to school, um, she saw this bag. And she then reached out to a fraternity brother of mine that I'd lost touch with 25 years ago. Uh, his name was Craig, and he lives down in Jersey. And he saw the bag. And I'm like, Turns out he's a surf caster in Jersey. I'm like, can I build you a bag? You want to try it out? So, yeah. So he started walking Jersey with it. And uh, things kind of exploded from there as people would see the bag on his shoulder and start to ask questions about it. But there's still a long progression to where you are today. And this is a normal progression for someone who's obviously, yeah. you know, they just spend a lot of time designing and all that. But still, you know, this, I know that building stuff for yourself or making stuff for yourself is a totally different level than making right. for other people. Right. So it, it, there is a big progression and it really was, you know, that was probably around, I want to say that would have been late 2013, somewhere in that time frame that Craig got that bag and started walking with it. And, uh, there was, I had enough people contacting me just out of the blue asking if I could build them a bag and stuff like that, that I had been doing a few, a few bags here and there. And if you saw my early bags, they were, they looked pretty much like every other bag that was out there, you know, a, a bag with a pocket stitched on the side, a pork rind holder stitched on the other side, stuff like that. I was really just, I was learning. And, uh, but I knew that there was that show, there was a show coming up and I had seen it on Facebook and stuff. It was the, uh, Jersey shore surf caster surf day show in 2014. I sent an email off and to a guy named Josh. And, uh, I remember he, uh, he messaged me back and he's like, yeah, we'd love to have you. And that, that was pretty terrifying to know that, you know, Here's and I'm this sure guy. After you met Josh and saw that he was 16 feet oh, tall, you oh, were exactly. even scarier. <laughs> yeah, he's, exactly. He's like the greatest guy in yes, the world. Yes, he is. Oh, yes, he sweetheart. is. Yeah, yeah. But that's when things kind of got real, you know, when I was going to attend a show. And uh, so ended up getting a rental car and uh, drove uh, from Illinois to Jersey. And it was one of those things that, that first show where everyone's like, 
who's the new guy? So I did. I showed up there with a with a handful of you know traditional bags that we're all familiar with from being around. But what had started to happen at that show was that guys were coming up to me and saying, can you build me one with a pocket on this side and a camera holder on this side? Or can you do one with a pork rind holder over here and a pocket over here? And can you do this with a leader wallet here? And I just realized it, it was overwhelming at that show, but it was such a, a good learning process to listen to everyone there. And so went back to, um, drove back to Illinois, 24 hour drive, pretty much a lot of time to think and realized that everything that I've been doing for myself and for the handful of guys doing building bags for and honing my skills, I pretty much had to scrap it all. It was, I knew that it, it I had to start over. I, I had some sewing skills, but I realized that in order to carve out a niche, produce what people wanted to fit their needs that I had to start over again. So that was kind of a, it was a difficult part of the drive home, but it was also energizing because I realized that what everyone was doing in the past wasn't necessarily what everyone wanted. It was what they were using because it was all that was available. So it was a, a starting over point. What what was your idea then to to give to the customer a, a different way of order? Was your idea to give them a bunch of uh, well the yeah, the designs? idea the the idea that I came up with was the modularity the 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 idea of modularity where I would have a base bag that could accept any accessory as well as a belt loop adapter that mimicked the side of a surf casting bag. So that any accessory that could go on to a surf casting bag could in turn relocate to the belt. So that was really um, the system, what the system boiled down to. Once I knew that system, once I had that in my mind um, of what I wanted to do, then I knew that I also wanted to give the customers a little more degree of um, personalization in the construction of the bag. So that where that's where it comes down to allowing for certain options that I thought that I should allow. Like they could put a leader wallet on the outside of the main flap, or they could put one underneath the flap because that was all stuff that I could bake into the build process without reinventing the wheel. And I could allow them to have, you know, if a guy liked orange stitching and trim, yeah, I can. I could give him orange stitching and trim stuff like that um, to to personalize it to match his uh, rod wraps stuff like that. So it, people, <laughs> to match people, his personality, maybe. They, and you know what? People want that. It, That's you know, great. surfcasters they are not all black and white. You're they, absolutely right. Why should we just get whatever was given to us and said, you know, that's what you got to have? You're right. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So. That now, was yeah. Go let ahead. me ask you a question. Like, how important is customer feedback? when it comes to designing this, uh, at least this modulation? Customer feedback is extremely important. Uh, and that's why the shows, those initial shows, and even to this day, shows are so important to me because I, I'd like to, I'm probably not a very good listener, but I try to be a good listener um, at the shows because people give me so many good ideas. You know, people will tell me, I, I want to have a, an accessory that will handle this or an accessory that will handle that. So I do need to listen to people and make sure that I, if I get enough requests for a certain accessory, then I'll look at designing something. But if it's someone that says, I need a bag that's a quarter inch taller and an eighth of an inch wider than what you're doing, no, I can't do that. But when it comes down to, you know, I, I need a, a water bottle holder that's going to handle my 20 ounce Gatorade bottle. Okay. Let's I've got 20 requests for that time to do something. What was the, the hardest lesson? Was it the material or, or you know, because I know that the material yeah. is very difficult to work with. And for most of us, they use the product. We don't think about it. We just open a bag and go fishing. Right. But I've seen people trying to turn a bag inside out when it was right. Done. 
It's a nightmare of a process. I well, don't think people know what is involved to make a bag. Right. Well, that for me, yeah, that that's crazy. I mean, when I look at one of my bags, that's like the back bay bag, for example, it's one of my more expensive bags and it's one of the smaller bags that I build. And the reason it's one of my more expensive bags is because it's about 40 minutes to turn that bag right side out because bags are built inside out and then they have to be reversed. And I, I wear leather gloves and I've got an old stool in the shop that I turn upside down. I've got a leather cover on one of the legs of it and it helps me to turn the bag inside out. But yeah, that's a, that's a real, uh, a real difficult physical part of the job. Um, but in terms of like challenges to actually starting Flatlander surf casting, you have to really tear the engine apart and realize that it's not all sailcloth and thread. It one of the first things I did when I started, and it was I give myself a lot of credit as I contacted an accountant and I said, What do I do? How do I start? I know that there's taxes involved, stuff like that. So I never had a formal business plan, um, but I did work with the accountant when I realized that it could be an actual business. And he helped me to establish that tackle bags like fishing lures or fishing rods, they're subject to federal excise taxes. So all of a sudden, I now have to not just be a fishing tackle bag builder, I have to keep track of IRS Form 720s federal excise taxes, and I have to file quarterly, and I have to maintain IRS deposits, and I have to make federal estimated tax deposits and state tax deposits. And you live in Massachusetts, where are, all the, where are so many orders coming from? Massachusetts, not like in Illinois. No one's buying a surf bag there. I don't have to collect state taxes. Massachusetts, all of a sudden, I've got a whole new layer. So I'd love to say that I get to sit behind the machine and and so for you know eight ten hours a day but there's a the a big part of the whole flatlander process was learning how to make sure that i was compliant and I, last thing i want to do is have some federal agency knocking on my door and you know you're not paying something on a bag <laughs> When it comes to custom bags, and I know that most of us who've been around kind of know the benefits, but sure. for someone who's just either starting in or doesn't know what the hype is all about, why should someone invest in a custom bag? Well, in terms of the custom bag, and I, I when you're saying and a I, custom when bag- When I say I, custom bag, I don't mean like something that fits a profile. Listen, when I started fishing, it was a, a Bronco bag, and sure. then I gravitated. Why, yeah, I think I, I had, I think my- I would call a custom bag something that it's it's built to last, not necessarily that fits exactly a niche the way I sure. want to do it. You know, I, I think that the biggest thing that people have to realize that goes into um, a, a custom bag, and it was one of it was a huge challenge for me. You know, when I got going on this, is that once I had a lot of the the nuts and bolts nailed down, you know, then you start to get into the whole process of sourcing the materials to do a custom bag. Um, and some of the stuff, it, it, it sounds simple, but in rudimentary, you know, you learn about sewing machine styles, you learn about needle styles. Well, you can't, you have to use a specific needle for sailcloth. And when you put two layers of sailcloth down, now you've got a whole new problem. And when you have to stitch a corner seam on that, where it's four layers of sailcloth, now you've got a whole new problem. So there's a lot of learning and a lot of machinery that's necessary in order to be able to construct a bag properly. So it's not going to fall apart. I mean, I had to learn about thread. I sourced my thread from a company in Germany because they make this thread that's great for like America's, America's cup sales. So it, it, that it's a big, it was a big learning process. I had to learn about webbing material composition. Um, you've got polypropylene, you've got polyester, you've got nylon. What's best for saltwater? What's going to fall apart in the sun? What's going to, what's going to be most durable. So, you know, that all of that stuff goes for like the thread and the trim and, you know, people don't realize that you know, sailcloth itself, it has 
multiple weights. It has multiple uh, weave patterns. So I had to work with all kinds of different companies from the get-go to make sure that I was sourcing the right the right products. And I so many people worked with me. Um, I went to, I think it was 2016 was the first show that I went to in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this was a uh, industrial fabrics association show. And it was, I met with Velcro from New Hampshire. I met with CNC companies from around, from Australia. I met with all kinds of companies and I, I just learned. I just took into the sailcloth companies were there. The thread companies were there. Everyone that I needed to deal with, stainless steel, hardware. I, I was able to, because I had a business license and I was looked at as a legit company, I was able to now get involved with some of the highest level components out there so that when I built a custom bag, I knew that it was being built with as good as I could get. And so, yeah, so that's kind of some background of just like material sourcing. It's, it was a big process. I mean, flying all over the country, I attended multiple shows, uh, to get the, uh, to get the right stuff for Flatlander bags. Most guys or gals, I have a lot of all kinds of customers across the board. Once they get into the sport, and I think all of us go through the process of we start with a basic bag and then we get hooked and then we're really into the sport. And then we start to probably a similar path to what I took research what's out there because we're not happy with what we've got. And a sailcloth bag, I mean, that's you're not going to be able to put a hook through that bag unless you're using a hammer. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to get into a blitz and all of a sudden you've got uh, the hook stack is stuck into some uh, nylon material. So if you're serious about, you know, walking the shoreline, wading, wetsuiting, where whatever, it doesn't matter. A, a, a good bag is something that's going to last you for years. So I would say that that is probably the number one reason that someone should look at it. If you're going to, if you're serious about the sport, you know, I had a professor one time that said the cheap and the uneducated buy everything twice. And that was, and that was where, you know, you buy the cheap bag and now you haven't done the research. You didn't do the research to start with. So you started out with a cheap bag and then you did the research and got yourself a good one. So I think to some extent, we also uh, tend to use the word custom in a wrong context because, yeah. you know, your bag or most bags that are out there should really be called a good quality bag instead of custom because they're right. not necessarily custom fitted for you. There's a customs option and there could be a custom bag, but a really good quality bag is head and shoulder above your regular bag that you buy at sports authority doesn't even exist sure. does it but the dicks does right you know, because those are mass market bags and whoever designed them has nothing know nothing about surf fishing it's mostly for carrying sinkers to go to the beach and some bait and there's yep. few slots so you get the you get the bad slots bad plastic inside bad canvas yep. rotten so the whole thing is just not something that that you are going to gravitate especially as you become a better surf caster so your your bags are really are, are more of a quality product than custom. You know, I word yeah. custom is a little overused in, in this kind of. Uh... Right. Well, even you know, for mine, for example, like my tubing. I mean, who thinks about the tubing in their surf casting bag? Okay, I, I I would never have either. But for me, I had to learn about material composition of tubes. And what would be best for someone that was fishing cold weather and warm weather. And then I had to find a manufacturer that could manufacture draw tubing to my specifications, my thickness, my material compositions, and cut them to length for me. Oh, I just take my money. Will you just take my money? Because I can't think on that level. That's like a whole other level. (laughs) Hot and cold plastic. I mean, seriously. Right. Well, that's what that's where I had to go if I wanted to try to 
to be as good as I possibly could. And I knew what I wanted. And I know that what I want, it's going to probably be more picky than the average person. So if I can make myself happy, then maybe it's that maybe that's good enough. I'm not sure. But, you know, I, I do, I get into the minutia and that's where it, it came down. I mean, I just had uh, two pallets of tubing shipped in here last week and, uh, I did see the trailer size. on the internet backing up to your house. Yeah, it's crazy Come because on. I've got to get I got to get a lift gate truck. I've got to get pallet jack. Ah, oh, it's crazy, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Does it ever get old seeing guys on a beach with a nice fish with your equipment around their waist? Oh, I love it. I I love it. I love it. And I get to, and and here's the here's the crazy thing is that I hear a lot about it. I mean, I have fished a handful of days this year because I am in the shop constantly, but I hear it. I hear it from Craig when he's down fishing Jersey. I hear it from my friends that are fishing on the Cape. You know, I saw a couple of your bags out there today, or someone will send me a picture and uh, no, it never gets old. I love it. Is that the biggest joy out of this process for you? I mean, business is business. We all like business, but, but I, I know... I mean, I run the Surfcaster Journal magazine, and I know Tommy sure. and I love the shows because we get to shake hands and people tell us how much in, they enjoy the content that's made right. for them. So I can understand how does that make me feel personally. Yep. Well, I, you know, I, I love the shows, stuff like that, and love being around the people. But I would also say that I really love what I do. I love being in the shop. I love it when I when I take a bag and take a picture of it and people probably see those pictures because I've got a you know a cedar shake backing that I will usually take a picture of the bag before when it's done and ready to go off to the customer I'll send them a picture of his bag and they love that and that and the one thing is is that when I see those pictures on different groups on Facebook or wherever on the internet I know that I took that picture and that guy's proud of that bag. Are your bags available to order only uh, in a customized version? Or do you have like a, a line of bags where people can order like a, you know, or is there always a wait for it? I mean, at different times, it's probably different. Yeah, I tried years ago to do a bag that was available all the time. And it was impossible to maintained because the orders that came in for the custom let's say custom bags where you know it wasn't black stitching black thread stuff like that those orders would take up all of my time so i never had any time to build inventory of like a stock bag so to say so i did do that for a while and whenever i attend the shows if I bring bags to a show, those are all built to like a stock pattern. Um, but I never, I used to have those available throughout the year. I tried to, but I couldn't maintain it. I'm literally capped out. And I, I say that, that I'm in the shop seven days a week and I'm usually out. I usually get out to the shop probably about 8 30 9 o'clock in the morning and i'm usually back in around nine o'clock at night so it's seven days probably 10 to 12 hours a day and that is to keep my head above water and you do everything yourself so you i do it 100 percent myself um yeah when my when my wife she was working at a uh pharmaceutical company back in illinois and this would have been in 27, early 2017, she got notification that she was being transferred. She could do the transfer out to Cambridge or take a package and see you later. So that's, you know, we ended up out here and as, you know, fate would have it, we found this great house on the South Shore that had a nice barn, I guess you'd call it a shop outbuilding on it. And uh, the guy who had built it, it was an electrician and I mean, he had all kinds of pneumatic lines that I need for a lot of my equipment. He, I've got every outlet of every voltage I could, I could desire. But the downside is, is that it's in a residential area. 
So when you say I'm a, I do it all myself, yeah, I do. I can, I can only hire family members. I can't have outside employees working here. So it's me, myself, and I. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I never even thought about it. I mean, I know you like what you do, but I never realized that you had constraints even if you wanted to. Absolutely. Even if I wanted to, I'm constrained by it because I love my shop. It's probably, I've got probably about a thousand square feet total that Flatlander takes up. And, uh, but I can't have outside employees to help me. So, and I really don't want to rent any place or how do I say it? I, I, if I wanted to grow, I know I'd have to start to do some outsourcing. And I don't know if I'm ready to cross that bridge yet. I'm too much of a control freak. As I have heard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would people be most surprised about Flatland? Well, I think when they come to the shop, I think that people are probably most surprised in the depth of what goes on here. What I, what I, the, the business, the way it's been, the way I've built it. And, um, I, I think that's probably the most surprising thing to people is it's not just one sewing machine up in the shop. There's a, I mean, this year I even brought in a CNC. Um, I have my own CNC fabric cutting system up in the shop. I think they'd be surprised that for a one man operation, the level of technology that I have poured into the company to try to make the best that I can. The other thing that they're really surprised about when they come up to the shop is that I don't have bags sitting around. There's, you come into the shop right now, there's one bag that's sitting here that had been uh, like, uh, if there was going to be shows this year, it was one that I started to build for a show. They're always surprised that let's I don't hope, have shelves of that bags. Happens, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to hold out hope for shows this, this winter. I've, uh, yeah, it's for me, for me, I've already made the decision that even if there are, I'm not, I won't be there this year. I it's just think it's not happen. irresponsible in some way. If that's how you feel, I can understand that. And, and I'm not going to question who will and who won't. I'll leave that discussion for another time. Right. Every, no, I, got that. Yeah. yeah, I had to make a decision early on because I have to pre-build inventory for the shows. And when I saw the direction that things were going, I decided to devote my time to try to accelerate in customers' orders and not building show um, show bags. So it, I usually have to do a, a give and take on that. And I try to build some slack into my schedule so that I don't um, push bags further out of line in order to, to attend shows. Um, so yeah, this year I've decided to uh, put it on the back burner. Where do you get your design idea? Who, who's the inspiration? In terms of the modularity, or in terms of just my the bag design in general, just well, like I the mean, overall. You need to have modularity is one thing, but I mean, as a whole business idea of yours, you have to have some inspiration, not necessarily by a person, uh, but in general sense, like where do you got your where do you get your ideas? Because I just saw that you have a patent for the boga, right? Yes, I have a okay. patent for the boga holder, and I've got that's a design patent. I've got a utility patent on the system. Right, the I'm saying system. that had to come out of somewhere. I mean, yeah, it's uh, I I I get asked for different stuff by people, and so you know my my. But ideas, you try to give them what they're asking for in your own way. It, well, yeah, what they what they're asking for, I I have to try to take an idea that someone is asking me for, first off, I've got to make sure that it has legs, that it's not going to be something that I'll build for one person and never build it again. Um, it has to be able to um, be sustainable. And from that, then I have to be able to make a, create a design that is um, functional, that I can actually sew. Um, I've had a lot of people, like for example, that will ask me for my Boga grip holder um, that can attach to a bag. Well, I can't do it because the attachment goes right where the, the metal is for the Boga grip holder. So there's, uh, it, it, I have to make sure that, it's, that it can functionally uh, build something as well. What's the best way to contact you? How did, how did the guys find you? I used to have a website and now it's basically just a Facebook? Okay, well, that was, yeah, that was a big thing for me is that I've never had a website. And that was um, a, it's something I struggled with. 
um, is whether or not to have a website. And I, I know it'd be really helpful to show my product, but for now, I use my Facebook page, my Instagram page. Those have worked really well. I tend to up, update my Instagram page more frequently than Facebook. One thing that I found that was really helpful is Google makes a thing called Google Docs. And I was able to build a whole order form on Google Docs. And I have a link to it on my Facebook page. But you have to access it through a computer like a laptop. You can't, for some reason, Facebook doesn't allow it to work on a phone. But so I've got a Google Doc there. And that is a way that people can, you know, kind of build a, build an order and get a quote from me, stuff like that. Um, you don't yeah, they, have that's a the only I mean, way. A lot of people don't have websites these days because the social media has kind of overtaken that whole concept. They, yeah, they have. But I still think that I'm, I still think I'm a little bit behind the eight ball because if social media ever does decide to, you know, put a fee on people like me that are doing stuff like that, it would be really probably good to have a, um, a website as backup. But for now, it would also be good to have Facebook stock at that time. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it, 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 the other thing is for me is that it's kind of a limiting factor. Um, I am capped out. I can't do anymore. And I know that if I had a website, it would add to to my problems. Um, well, you would also have to kind of update the website because, you know, the static page that you make it once, it's pretty and you're like, ooh, yeah. this is nice. And then two months pass by and you're just looking at same pictures. At least the Instagram and Facebook, it's constantly updated. Right, it's constantly updated. Yeah, and the, the one funny thing is, is that on my Facebook page, people will visit it. and. I don't think I've updated my Facebook page since I did a post about um, COVID-19. It's been seven, eight months since I've done anything on Facebook. The main thing that I utilize my Facebook page for is I, I was getting uh, a lot. I would get a lot of wellness checks. People would um, contact me, put a bag in line, and then they would email me constantly. And don't get me wrong. I love talking to my customers. But they would be checking, hey, where am I in line? Where am I in line? How, when is it going to happen? When am I going to get it? And so I realized that I could create another thing called a Google Sheet. I pinned that to my uh, Facebook page. So that's really what I use my Facebook page for. The top post there is this bag progress chart. No, so I people see. that are in line. To the top so people can see where. Yeah, they can, cl they can the click on is. the link and they can see their initials and their bag. That's, and that's it honestly works. I all, mean, that's all you it really does. need, honestly. I know. And you know what? People use it. I mean, I have guys that will message me, hey, I see my initials at spot number 31. I'm glad to see I'm moving up the list. So people, people, they use it. So Instagram, though, is probably the best place to actually see pretty pictures. It's a much more of a visual medium than Facebook is. It really is. Plus, my, my kids tell me that Facebook's only for old people now, so. Yeah, Instagram, I think, is where, in terms of the in terms of me, that's where it's at right now. Hey, I accept being old. I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah. What the future holds for Flatlander? With the accessories and stuff like that in my bags, they can buy a bag from me, and then, you know, it's not uncommon for a guy that's bought a bag two years ago to contact me for an accessory later. I think there's always a little bit of concern, like, is, is he going to disappear like everyone else has? I would probably say that, you know, right now I have, I love working and I've got no plans uh, to, to retire or anything like that. But I think that ultimately I'll probably start taking some longer breaks. We do have our a family place up in Northern Wisconsin and a lot of, you know, my wife, she's the major breadwinner of the family and she can work from anywhere now. So I would imagine we'll probably take some longer stretches of time and hang out up there, but don't plan on shutting the, shutting this down. I plan on keeping it going. Well, we do wish you well because you are working, as you said, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Those are long, long No, hours. I do. I need to take some, uh, I, I need to take some time and just get on the water. So take some time for me now and then. We are grateful that you took time from your busy day to listen to the Surfcasters Journal Night Shift Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, we would love if you would share it with your fishing buddies and leave a rating and review to whatever app you use to listen to us. 
Your feedback and ratings help other surfcasters discover our podcast. Also check out our publication dedicated to surf fishing, Surfcasters Journal Magazine at surfcastersjournal.com. Tight lines and good fishing.